Welcome to Get Real Health. I'm your host, Dr. Chana Davis. This show cuts through the hype and the noise to give you science-based insights from real experts. Together, we want to help you make smart, healthy choices. Today, we'll be speaking with Dr. Jennifer Gardy about infectious disease outbreaks. We'll be focusing on COVID-19, the coronavirus that's taking the world by storm. We'll be discussing why this outbreak is so severe and what you can do to mitigate risk for yourself and your family. Dr. Jennifer Gardy will also give us the world's shortest course in infectious disease epidemiology, covering some basic principles that will allow you to follow this outbreak as it unfolds. Dr. Gardy holds a PhD in bioinformatics, and she's currently the Deputy Director of Surveillance, Data, and Epidemiology at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Prior to her role at the Gates Foundation, she worked at BC's Centers for Disease Control, where she was a scientist tracking infectious disease outbreaks using DNA technologies. She's also a passionate science communicator. She was a professor at UBC where she taught courses on science communication, specifically around risk. She's also narrated several television shows, including The Nature of Things, and she's the author of two children's books. Dr. Jennifer Gardy, thank you so much for joining me for a conversation about infectious disease outbreaks. It's certainly a timely topic. My pleasure. It is my favorite thing in the universe to talk about. <laughs> Perfect. Um, can you start by just um, talking a little bit about yourself and the different hats that you wear and you know why you're in a good position to speak to this topic? For sure. Uh, so my current title is Deputy Director of Surveillance, Data, and Epidemiology at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where I work on the malaria team in the Global Health Division. Um, what does that actually mean? Though it's a very big title, but it doesn't exactly tell you what I do. Um, the Gates Foundation is an organization that really sort of does three things. It does a lot of funding, uh, does a lot of advocacy, and it does a lot of bringing people together to solve some of the world's biggest problems. And my role as as a deputy director is really about combining all of those things, providing a lot of strategy and leadership advice, um, particularly around surveillance data and epidemiology for infectious diseases. So my team thinks about how we can use data to drive better decision making by country or national programs. That can be everything from routine health systems data. It can be really interesting novel data types, satellite imagery, um, cell phone movements to track population population mobility, and it can include genetic and genomic data as well um, from both disease pathogens and disease vectors. So before I joined the foundation, I've been there for about a year, um, but before that, I was based at the British Columbia Center for Disease Control. I was a senior scientist there, and I had a joint appointment with the School of Population and Public Health at the University of British Columbia and the Canada Research Chair in Public Health Genomics. So I was leading a research group that was using genetics and genomics as a tool to answer questions in public health, particularly around uh, how do infectious diseases start, uh, how do they spread from person to person, and how can we use that in information to stop current outbreaks and prevent future outbreaks. So a lot of work on tuberculosis, um, a lot of work on vaccine preventable viral diseases like measles and mumps, and uh, a lot of things related to influenza virus. And much of the work that I did over the last decade um, was kind of establishing techniques in this new area of genomic epidemiology, using genomics as a tool to track infectious disease. And a lot of those techniques we're seeing um, being rolled out right now in the current coronavirus outbreak. That's quite a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's and, been a busy decade, a very busy day. Yes, and I know you do some science communication as well, which is part of why you came to mind for me immediately. I've seen some of your work um, and you're yeah. a great communicator. So thank you for that. Can you just t touch on that briefly? Yeah. No, thank you so much for the compliment. Um, I, in addition to doing all of that crazy stuff in genetics, data, infectious disease, I always had a side hustle of science communication. Um, really, that meant a lot of television work. Uh, I guess for about the last 11 years, uh, I've been working with CBC television, uh, guest hosting a bunch of episodes of The Nature of Things, Canada's uh, longest running documentary series. It's on for an hour every week and talks about uh, all sorts of scientific topics, things from 
from the natural world. So I've been lucky enough to host a bunch of uh, episodes of that over the years. I did a lot of guest hosting on Daily Planet, which used to be uh, Discovery Channel Canada's nightly science news magazine. I always kind of described it as entertainment tonight, but for science. So hosted many hours of that over the years. Uh, wrote a children's book uh, about five years ago now um, called It's Catching the Infectious World of Germs and Microbes. Got another one coming out uh, next year. And I also like doing a lot of science communication training too. So while I was at UBC, my one course that I taught was the graduate course in risk communication for public health um, at UBC's uh, School of Population and Public Health. And a lot of workshops for grad students, for faculty members, for academics on how you can be better at communicating your science. So it's always been a really fun side hustle. And I've been lucky at the Gates Foundation. I get to carry it on a little bit. Uh, we're doing a little web series called Sick History. Um, the very first episode was released a few months ago about malaria, and I get to host that. Oh, that sounds like a lot of fun and, and very important. Yeah. I think that the, the pub, risk communication in the public in particular is such, uh, there's such unmet need there. Absolutely. It's uh, the current coronavirus outbreak is, I think, really demonstrating both the opportunities and the challenges. Um, if you can really get on top of your messaging, get out there early, um, be relaying useful, timely, actionable and reassuring information to the public, you can usually get people on board with some of the uh, individual measures that you have to do to stop outbreaks. Things like increasing people's hand washing behaviors, um, social distancing, so encouraging people to work from home. Um, um, if you don't take the right approaches to risk communication, though, you end up creating a real atmosphere of fear. And so we've certainly seen a lot of misinformation and a lot of panic spreading um, if it's not done properly. So it's been an interesting time to, to watch it now from the outside. Yeah, no, I, look, I look forward in our, in our chat to, to digging more into um, you know, your sort of your thoughts on if you were the head of a country or what would, you know, what messages would you be communicating? So I want to get, I want to get to that. But first I want to do a bit of science communication and give you an opportunity to kind of cover some basic concepts of epidemiology um, and the role of genomics. So how has our ability to use DNA as a marker, you know, um, impacted epidemiology as a whole, disease tracking as a whole, and just some basic terminology like outbreak versus epidemic versus pandemic and um, and some of the factors that as you build a model for tracking a disease, what are the key variables that influence the severity and duration of epidemics? So that's a lot, but um, <laughs> start where you think you, you're the educator. So you start with where you think kind of, kind of laying the foundation towards getting people to an understanding of how these models work and how we can predict um, the spread of a disease. For sure. Um, so why don't we start with uh, one of the most basic principles in epidemiology, which is the notion of the epidemiological triangle. I'm trying to make a triangle, but it's more of an upside down heart here. Um, the epidemiological triangle basically explains that any disease um, and any outbreak is going to be a function of three things. It's going to be a function of the host, the pathogen, and the environment. And within each of those three bins, there are a number of features that will vary from disease to disease, from outbreak to outbreak. So we can kind of look at those uh, in turn. Um, we might as well start with the pathogen first. That's one that people usually find the most interesting to start with. Um, so in terms of things that influence um, whether or not a particular um, pathogen pathogen introduction is going to spark and form a really big outbreak um, or an epidemic or a pandemic. And we'll just take a brief um, tangent here to explain those three terms. Outbreak is just any cluster of cases of a disease that is more than you would expect in a region over time. So you might have an outbreak of salmonella associated with a particular restaurant, more cases of salmonella than you would expect in a given week. That's an outbreak. Epidemic is basically when an outbreak gets really, really big and starts lasting for a while, but it's still relatively contained in a particular uh, geographic area. So we could talk about, um, you know, an epidemic of uh, hospital acquired infections, antimicrobial resistant organisms. They're pretty widespread. Um, they tend to be all across a region, um, but a pandemic is when the outbreak grows to essentially global proportions. And these are very sort of acute events for the most part. Um, things like H1N1 in 2009, and now um, the coronavirus pandemic, it's moved from a small outbreak in Wuhan to a large outbreak in Wuhan to an epidemic in China. And now that cases are being detected in hundreds of countries around the world, uh, it's attained pandemic status. So 
when we go back to the epi triangle and say what's influencing a disease to you know stay as an outbreak become an epidemic or become a pandemic the thing we look at first is the pathogen and there's a whole bunch of things that can influence um, on the pathogen side of things whether or not it's going to take off and be really successful um, and cause a pandemic like the coronavirus or whether it's going to become something that will just kind of hang around on a regular basis like the flu for example so one of the important things is understanding pre-existing immunity at the population level. So as a collective whole, um, are we generally immune to a particular threat or are we immunologically naive? So if it's something um, that we've seen before in our lives or if it's something that we've been vaccinated against, that dramatically reduces the chance of a particular pathogen taking off. And a really nice example of this uh, goes back to the H1N1 pandemic in 2009. And typically, when you have uh, an influenza season, you'll see that very, very young people and very, very old people tend to be uh, the most affected. We call it a U-shaped morbidity or mortality curve. So it's highest, uh, most risk and danger in most cases and most poor sequelae in very, very young people and very, very old people. Um, but we were seeing a slightly different pattern in H1N1. It was a bit more of a W shape, and there was still some morbid morbidity and mortality in our senior population, but really senior people, um, people in their 80s, for example, didn't seem to be getting H1N1 at a rate that we would expect them to. Mm -hmm. And the reason for this was the H1N1 virus that popped up in 2009 was actually really similar to the virus that had been circulating in 1918, the so-called wow. Spanish flu pandemic. And so there was some pre-existing immunity to that original 19, uh, 1918 virus in some of our very, very old population. So things like pre-existing population immunity can really influence whether a pathogen is going to take off. Um, the, one of the other things to think about on the pathogen side is what is that organism's inherent potential to cause severe disease. So if you look at flu, for example, um, the seasonal flu uh, comprises a few different types of flu. Um, there's influenza A and B, and within those, there's two different distinctions. In influenza A, we have some viruses that we describe as H1N1 viruses, and we have some that we uh, describe as H3N2 viruses. Um, it just refers to the types of little spiky proteins that they have on their outer surface. And the H1N1s are different H3N2s. Um, and we know that the H3N2 virus, something about it just seems to cause slightly more severe disease. So they're, you know, not terribly different from each other, but there's just something about it um, that makes it a little more dangerous than H1N1. We also want to look at features of the pathogen um, like resistance. Um, is there resistance to antivirals if it's a virus, to antibiotics if it's a bacterium, something that might influence our choices for treatment and how quickly we can uh, treat people that are actually infected and get them back to healthy status again. And there's a number of other factors about the virus that we like to look at when we're trying to model uh, the spread of an outbreak. In the early days of an outbreak, we want to figure out very quickly how fast might this be growing? What's our kind of worst case scenario? So we look at things like incubation period, uh, how long uh, an amount of time is it between when you are exposed to that pathogen and when you start to show symptoms. We can look at things like the generation time, um, the time between symptom onset in person one and symptom onset in person two that they infect. We can look at the infectious period, how long you're actually shedding infectious material for and you're capable of infecting others. So quite a few things on the pathogen side. Similarly, on the host and the environment side, there's a bunch of other stuff we can look at. On the host side, we can look at individual susceptibility. Um, have you been previously exposed? Have you been vaccinated? We can look at your vulnerability to severe outcomes. Do you have a pre-existing condition that might put you at higher risk of um, becoming very critically ill? Um, we can look at things like the transmission rate um, based on social contacts between people. How quickly will an infection move from person to person. And on the environmental side, we could think about things like seasonality. Uh, a lot of infections, particularly viral infections, do very well in cold climates and transmission tends to decrease in warmer months. So is that a feature of our pathogen that we're looking at? Um, how long does a pathogen survive on a surface? So um, if you touch your hand to something and then touch your face, um, are you likely to be able to transmit the disease that way? Um, 
crowded spaces, crowded environments are obviously going to create a lot more risk of spread. So there's a whole bunch of different things in that triangle. And not only does every disease behave differently, but every outbreak will behave differently too. So coronavirus in Wuhan might be very different than coronavirus in Chicago, where I'm sitting today. Mm -hmm. Wow, that was a great whirlwind tour. I learned a lot from that. <laughs> Thank you. So with that context, I guess, how, um, which of those variables do we understand currently for COVID-19? Which ones do we not understand? And I guess you're saying that they may change in different contexts. So yeah, which ones do we know? And which ones, um, if any, are the most, tend to be the biggest drivers and most determinant of the, of the outbreak severity? Yeah, it's a great question. And with new pathogens uh, like uh, the virus causing COVID-19 that we've never seen before, there's definitely more unanswered questions than there are answered questions. But as researchers have turned their attention to all of these different aspects of the triangle, we're starting to learn a lot more. Um, every day there are new papers being published, particularly as preprints, um, so they're able to get out there freely available to the public really quickly. Researchers are making their data available and allowing us to draw some conclusions like, for example, it seems that the um, incubation period, the time from when you're exposed to when you start showing symptoms, is on average about five days. Um, most people, uh, over 90% of people that do develop an infection and symptoms after an exposure will do so within about 11 days. So that tells us things like the 14-day quarantine period um, that people are using is a very good length of time. That to be sufficient um, to capture if you were exposed and are going to develop disease, that 14-day window is enough. In terms of what are the biggest drivers for um, what's causing the outbreak to spread, really a lot of it is just that pre-existing, the lack of pre-existing population immunity. This is a new virus that is working its way extremely quickly through a totally vulnerable and immunologically naive population. But what we've seen, um, particularly with the example of uh, some of the cities in China, um, South Korea as well, is when you start implementing things like social distancing. Um, which basically says, you know, try to stay in as much as possible, avoid other people. If you can work from home, do it. Um, and when you're out in public, keeping a distance of about six feet, uh, three meters from people that might be infectious, uh, or sorry, two meters, um, and regular hand washing, all the things that you can do to kind of, um, you know, push yourself away from, <laughs> from human contact uh, do tend to work. And so what you would normally expect to see in an outbreak where you're not intervening at all is uh, exponential growth for a while and then a little bit of a peak and then a slow decline. But what you can do with social distancing measures that we've learned from previous outbreaks and that we're seeing in some of the settings that have implemented them for coronavirus is you can flatten that curve and you can sort of squish it out over a longer period of time. You don't have a huge, huge bolus of cases that might overwhelm the healthcare system. Um, so by practicing things like social distancing and being uh, just removing yourself from contact with a lot of other people, um, you can actually have a, a remarkable difference. Uh, you can make a remarkable difference in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, I'm sure this is impossible to project, but what would be some projections of timelines before this would fizzle out? And how would, you know, what are, how do we go about doing that? I mean, <laughs> what, I guess looking, at pre looking at some precedents, for example, I don't really have a good sense of even remembering, hearkening back to H1N1, SARS, 1918, like how, how long do those things take to run their course? And is it all over the map? It's all over the map. It's pathogen by pathogen. It's very dependent on um, how quickly a vaccine is introduced. So going back to H1N1, for example, that was the year I first started working for the BC Center for Disease Control. And uh, it, the outbreak had started just a couple of weeks before I joined the center. It was a really exciting time. Um, and we found that that was sort of March, April. Um, by about October, a vaccine had been made available. And by that flu season, October, November, uh, it had really kind of dropped off the radar. I mean, it certainly reappeared next flu season, and it's been part of our flu seasons ever since. Um, but we have no idea what's going to happen with the 
current outbreak. We have no idea whether warmer weather, as some people have suggested, will um, decrease transmission. It may, it may not. With H1N1, we saw transmission all through the summer months, so it didn't seem to matter. We don't yet have an exact timeline on a vaccine um, with accelerated push on it. It could be ready in six, eight, ten months. It could be a bit longer term, uh, 12 months. We really have no idea at this point. Well, yeah, I think I was listening to um, a news story today, uh, you know, with, speaking with a travel agent, he was saying that it's the uncertainty itself that's one of the one of the toughest things for people to handle, I think. Yeah, and uncertainty is, you know, when you're thinking about risk communication and how do you talk to the public about infectious diseases, when you're in a crisis situation where um, it's something brand new, uh, nobody's ever seen it before, there's a lot of unanswered questions, communicating that uncertainty is one of the most important things you can do. Even, you know, if you're an agency like the CDC, an agency like the WHO, if you don't have information, you need to go out there and let the public know that you don't have that information now, but you need to tell them what you're doing to get that information. Because if you opt for something like not sharing information with the public or not going in front of the public for daily press conferences or, or saying, you know, we'll, we'll get back in touch with you when we know more, um, it, it's just a way to create and engender mistrust and suspicion. If you're out there, though, every day saying, this is the situation, this is what we know today, this is what we still don't know, and here's what we're doing to try to address those facts. That goes a long way in building uh, public trust and really reinforcing transparency. Mm -hmm. You just, um, this conversation about vaccines just triggered um, an uncertainty is making me think about, so if, how, how do you go about, um, I, I'm actually was listening to a podcast about development of sort of a universal vaccine for flu, but mm -hmm. this conversation had me thinking about the safety testing that goes into vaccines. And, and you know, we when there's something that's population wide, of course, even a 0.1% adverse event is starts to be a big deal. And so how but how can you possibly implement that scale of testing in a short time period? So what do they have different rules for epidemics and vaccine uh, safety and testing? Or do you know how that all I am not an expert in this area, so all I can tell you is that um, when we've seen uh, outbreak situations before where there are potential therapies, um, it is often a lot easier to circumvent the long bureaucratic process that would normally go into play for approval of a new therapeutic or vaccine um, for emergency use. So um, in Ebola, for example, some of the uh, therapeutic trials that were out there uh, were ones that um, were accelerated when you saw the West Africa outbreak happen so that we could actually get uh, these therapies into people and determine whether they were making a difference. And when happily in the case of the Ebola outbreak um, back in 2014, 2015, they did make a difference. And so you're able to really scale this up in a much bigger way. But uh, certainly the vaccine development space is, is not my forte. I wouldn't want to comment yeah. anything beyond. Yeah. Well, certainly any medical intervention intervention is a trade-off between cost and benefit. And when you're in the middle of an outbreak, there the benefit starts to really dial up. That's very true. Yeah. Yeah. So why don't we move into if you were head of the province where I am in British Columbia, or you were, you were head of the, a country, what would be the sorts of statements that you would give in very concrete, what would be the sort of concrete actionable advice you would give to people? And I think the number one question when I sent out some feelers to get from my uh, on Instagram um, was, you know, is panic really warranted? How big of a deal is this really like, what's the appropriate level of concern? And then what are the mm -hmm. actions that you can do to play your part, to do your part? Yeah, um, as with any outbreak of infectious disease, um, even if it's something like seasonal flu, you should always be concerned and you should be thinking about what can I do to make sure that um, I'm healthy and safe, my family's healthy and safe, my loved ones are. Um, so my biggest recommendation, and I'm sure it's the recommendation of every single infectious disease and public health expert out there, is practicing good hand hygiene. Um, there's famous Canadian physician, William Osler, uh, who said soap, water, and common sense are the best disinfectants. And that's really true. So being a lot more vigilant with your hand washing. So when you're out and about carrying some hand sanitizer, kind of treating every surface you might touch as if it were contaminated. And so remembering to wash your hands, sanitize your hands frequently when you're out and about. When I come home, um, the first thing I do is wash my hands. Um, try to remember 
not to touch your face as much. This is something that is so hard for people to stop doing because when you actually think about how frequently you do things like sit like this or you know move a hair away from your face, it's pretty remarkable um, just how much and how frequently we do it. So really being aware. Uh, of how much you're doing it and trying to make an active effort to stop doing that. And then as much as your uh, your job, your lifestyle allows, um, making those decisions to not be in crowded places where there could be transmission. So it might mean, um, you know, not ordering tickets to that hockey game or that basketball team uh, game. It might mean postponing a trip. Uh, my dad for some reason decided to book a cruise vacation uh, and every day I'm sending him text messages going, are you sure you wanna go on that floating Petri dish? So making the decision that uh, will keep you safe. But remembering that while concern is always warranted in a situation like this, don't let that concern turn to panic. Uh, I think keeping calm and just recognizing that this is something we'll all get through, and we'll get through it faster and, uh, and healthier when we get through it together. And that means adopting those better hygiene practices and uh, spending a little less time out there in public making social contacts than we ordinarily would. Yeah, I guess I would just, just to be even more specific, you know, an example for me is that tomorrow, um, so, it, you know, I'm, I'm in British Columbia where we, where we have, I believe, 39 cases, and a couple of those are community transmissions, and some of them appear to be travel acquired. Um, so in that context, you know, my son has school, has this annual fair where they show off their project and the school decided to not do it as a mass school-wide event, but let classes sort of do some of them their own thing. So we have an invitation tomorrow to go, you know, there's a, a, a classroom that will contain, you know, 20 kids and potentially 20 adults and fairly close quarters. And I just don't know, it's hard, it's very hard for me to judge is that, is it being overly cautious to not attend or, you know, what's, what's an appropriate risk and how, how would you go about kind of making a decision like that? It's all personal, I think. Yeah. You know, this really is boiling down to personal decisions. Um, mm -hmm. You know, no health authority can tell individual families what to do. Um, you know, no microbiologist, epidemiologist can show up on screen and say, you should do this and you shouldn't do this. It really does boil down to um, the choices that you want to make. Um, if I were in a city where there was extensive ongoing transmission, I would certainly think twice about going out to any crowded place where there's a restaurant, um, a concert, something like that. But um, I'm in a city right now where there's, uh, I think as of today, about 25 confirmed cases in the area. And uh, while I'm certainly you know, not buying tickets to Bulls games or Blackhawks games or anything, uh, I am still going out to restaurants, concerts, things like that. But I'm ready to change my behavior at a moment's notice. If things get uh, worse in the next few days or weeks, I'm more than happy to say, oh, okay, you know, it's just Netflix and popcorn for me. Mm -hmm. And I think many people, including myself, are mostly concerned about, you know, their parents or grandparents and should, you know, the question of should you visit them or not? And I just, I just don't know any any thoughts on how to f factor the age into the equation, you know. Well, we certainly know that um, older people are the ones that are most at risk in this outbreak, and that's often because of pre-existing conditions. So respiratory conditions might be something like um, COPD, uh, something like that. Uh, I would be very, very cautious, I think, about visiting. If I had older relatives, um, I probably wouldn't be seeing them as frequently, uh, given the transmission situation that we're seeing now, and especially uh, given transmission that's happened in a number of settings um, in nursing homes. Uh, we've seen this in uh, British Columbia. We've seen it in Seattle, other places. Um, so if you have a loved one that is in a long-term care facility, that's another area where I would ease off on visiting switch to something like FaceTime or video calls to keep that connection going, uh, but maybe don't do it in person. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I guess just taking a step back from COVID-19, um, again, what are some of the things that you think apply independent of this sort of outbreak situation that we don't do a great job of uh, in terms of public health hygiene? <laughs> 
<laughs> I think you know, public health is an interesting place. I mean, anybody that works in public health would love to work themselves out of a job. <laughs> We'd rather not have anything to do. Um, and the way we approach that is prevention. We would much rather see upstream innovations that mean that people just don't get sick, period. We'd rather not have to investigate outbreaks of, uh, you know, influenza in a nursing home or tuberculosis in a homeless shelter. We would just rather those things not happen in the first place. So um, as much as healthcare systems can invest in that upstream strengthening and funding activities that promote healthy lifestyles, reduce some of the inequities that lead to differences in health outcomes, those are the things that we need to be focusing on. So in the infectious disease space, uh, there's a lot of room for thinking about vaccine development. It's a lot easier to just not get something in the first place than it is to try and treat it and stay ahead of resistance to, uh, to treatment. So I really think, you know, as public health, by investing in that upstream primary prevention, you can do a tremendous amount of downstream good. The challenge is that um, when you're dealing with funding for healthcare systems, typically um, governments like to see uh, impact and results in the short term, something that they can bring up next election cycle and say, look what we did. And unfortunately, the easiest wins are at the end of that spectrum. They're at the, the hospital level, you know, reduced hospital wait times by pumping money into to higher staffing levels. And there's not a lot of the governments that are really putting the forethought into that upstream planning piece and saying, well, if we just invested in, you know, reducing some of the inequities and in social determinants of health, maybe we wouldn't have so many people going to the hospital 5, 10, 15, 25 years later. So it can be a real challenge. And another challenge of working in public health is that um, it's the dog that doesn't bark when you are doing a good job. Nobody notices right, <laughs> when the right. are when the systems are working, nothing bad is happening. Right. Um, I just thought of a specific question that applies both to COVID-19 and to general, you know, preventative health. Can you share a couple of thoughts on pros and cons, hand washing versus hand sanitizer? Oh, uh, always do go for hand washing when you can. Uh, soap and water um, is it's the best thing you can do. Uh, hand sanitizer is fantastic. Can you, can you just you... quickly say why from a mechanistic perspective? <laughs> Let's get nerdy here. Um, so viruses are in, they're basically little balls. And part of the little ball um, is a, like a membrane that's made of lipids, um, fats. These are little molecules that have this very unique property in that um, part of the molecule likes water and part of the molecule kind of hates water. And it turns out that it's really easy to disrupt um, little uh, um, collections of those sorts of molecules with soap. You can basically go in and kind of tear them apart. So when you're using soap and water, you are basically tearing apart those little viral particles um, through the magic action of soap. And so it's a very, very simple, cost-effective, totally physical way to you know, like bust open viruses and boom, they're dead. Um, hand sanitizer, Alcohol does essentially do the same thing, um, but it's it's a lot easier and cheaper to do it under the tap with soap. Hand sanitizer's place is really when you're out and about and you want something to use quickly when you know you're not gonna be able to get to a sink and some water. Um, so I always carry a small one around in my purse um, or in the pocket of each of my coats. I carry more of them these days, um, but I use them only if hand washing is not an option. So maybe you're just out and you happen to have touched a uh, hole on the subway or a bus, you know, like, mm, it could it be potentially a contaminated surface? I'm on a bus, I'm about to get off the bus, there's no sink, let me just grab my hand sanitizer. So it's really, it's not about a functional difference between the two things, it's just about a process difference, mm -hmm. where and when are you going to use them? Mm -hmm. yeah, I just saw, there was a nice um, little mini video from Genome BC on, on, on hand washing and how it works. And I thought it was nice. Sometimes people know what they should do and just knowing the how helps them implement a little yeah. better. But for 20 seconds, make sure you get in there everywhere, backs of your hands too. Um, there is certainly no shortage of hand washing infographics available yeah. on the internet right now. So yes. uh, study up and uh, sing happy birthday twice and you're good to go.
Okay, I want to wrap up with two really quick fill in the blank questions where I think we kind of already know the answers, we've touched on them, but just to really drive things home. So fill in the blank. If there's one thing that you should be doing to improve, um, to play a role in this pandemic and you know, and keeping yourself and your family safe, it would be? Wash your dang hands. That's what I thought. Oh. <laughs> and if there's one thing that you should not be doing and you're doing you know, yourself and others a disservice, it would be? Going to work or out when you are sick and spreading misinformation on the internet. Check your sources <laughs> carefully. Yes, I love it. Um, actually, so that would be that was what I meant to wrap up. But could you just um, put in a plug for where you would recommend what what do you consider reliable information sources in a, in a situation like this? Yeah, so you want to be listening to places uh, like CDC.gov in the U.S., the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in British Columbia, the BC Center for Disease Control, and my friend and former colleague, Dr. Bonnie Henry, the provincial health officer, is amazing. Listen to everything that Bonnie says and do what she mm -hmm. says to do. The World Health Organization, basically any major institutions that are out there. Be very wary of things that you see shared on social media, whether it's Twitter or Facebook. Um, very rarely do you know the origin of those stories and there's a lot of misinformation floating around um, but cdc bc cdc who trust those voices okay thank you so much jen for this fascinating conversation my pleasure wash your hands okay <laughs> i'm gonna head off and wash my hands right now <laughs> excellent good that's what i like okay, to hear <laughs> bye for now